Okay, hi, so I'm, my name is Eva Sincic. So I'm the lecturer for the course of real analysis, so this is my email. So I'm currently a research um, scientist at the University of Nova Gorica, which is in Slovenia, it's just behind through the, <laughs> the border, but I'm Italian. And uh, so basically the main, I would like just to outline the, the topic of this course. So we will first uh, introduce the Lebesgue measure, then after having introduced the Lebesgue measure, we will deal with the Lebesgue integral. Then we will discuss uh, differentiation and integration, which are somehow new topics, but very closely to this to one. And finally, I will just introduce some few notion of LP spaces, okay? Okay, maybe some of you already studied this, this subject. Do you already know this or? LP spaces? Yeah. No, no, I mean all, all these things, Do you, have you already? Okay, okay, in case it will be a repetition. And so all this, uh, I mean, all these arguments will be carried over in one space dimension, so in R, okay? So I will recommend you some, some book. So the book of Royden, which will be um, somehow the, the book that I will follow. So real analysis. Basically, we will study the chapter from three to chapter uh, six of this book. So you, you, you will find some copy in the library here, okay? So another good book is the book of Whedon and Zygmunt. So the title is Measure and Integral. And finally, a very classical book, maybe a little bit tough, but it's, it's a good text. Book of Rodin. It's real and complex analysis. Okay. We then, we, yeah, it's uh, an H and Zygmunt. This is the R2 authors, yeah. So, so as I told you, s somehow the main topic of this course will be the Lebesgue integral, which somehow the aim is to extend uh, the notion of Riemann integral and especially to extend uh, uh, the class of function which are integrable. And this also we require to introduce uh, uh, the domain on, on which these functions are, are defined, okay? So just to give you, before starting with uh, giving uh, the definition and the notion, I will just somehow motivate why we will need to enlarge this space, for instance, of continuous function. So for instance, consider, <laughs> Um, consider a function f in a just closed interval with values in R, a continuous function. 
Okay. So in consider <coughs> the integral, you can think about it as a very elementary notion of integral, as for instance, the Riemann integral. And in the most elementary case, you can think about it as the area between the graph and the x-axis, okay? So we shall see that this notion will be not enough when you deal for the application to ordinary or partial differential equation, okay? So we will have to enlarge because when you deal with the application with PDE or ODE, you will need to, to somehow to define a norm which is, uh, uh, which is defined by means of an integral, okay? And also what you need uh, is that the space which is defined with this norm must be complete, okay? We will see that if you define, for instance, the space of continuous function, you will endow, endow the space of continuous function with a norm which is defined by uh, an integral, this will not give you a complete space. So a, a space which is not complete is not very useful for application, okay? This is why somehow we will need to enlarge uh, the set of, of the function, okay? okay? Okay, so, um, okay, as I told you, consider this norm. Defined in a very simple way. Okay, you have f is continuous, so the modulus, the absolute values of f is still a continuous function. And it's easy to see that uh, this, uh, uh, this, um, I mean, uh, th this function is, is, it's a norm, okay? Because it's not negative, it's zero if, uh, if and only if f is zero. If you, if you multiply it for a constant, the result will be um, the integral times the absolute value of the constants and the triangle inequality also, okay? This is very easy. Okay, so uh, now we endow the space of continuous function Okay, so we domain defined in AB with values in R with this, with this norm, okay? Okay, of course, starting from this norm, you can always define, <coughs> you can always define a metric, okay? Okay, you can just take the difference between F minus G. So as I told you, as I already anticipate you, this definition of the metric will not give rise to a complete space, okay? And uh, we need completeness in the application because usually you have to pass to the limit, and so you want that good property must be preserved when you pass to the limit, okay? So, uh, okay, I, I recall you that um, a metric space is, uh, is a space when you, which has this property if you have a Cauchy sequence it converts and uh, the limit has to belong to the space itself, okay? So now I will just briefly exhibit a sequence of continuous function whose limit does not belong to, to the space of continuous function. So I just uh, I will introduce this sequence of function by the graph, which maybe is the, is the, is the best things. So you have your interval a, b. So took a point in the middle, for instance, point c, and then took a point c plus 1 over n. And consider the function fn defined as follows. So this is the root, the y-axis, for instance. So is 0 between between A and C, here is zero. Between C plus one over N and B is equal to one, okay? And here is defined by a fine interpolation, okay? 
So probably uh, the analytic definition should be this, uh, just to be this with zero between four x between a and c. Here should be n x minus c n when x is in between c and c plus one over n n is equal to one for x between c plus one over n and b. Okay. Okay, so this function is continuous because, because the values at c and c plus one over this c plus one over n matches if you take the limit on the right and on the left. Okay, so let us first check this, that this fn is a is a Cauchy sequence in the in the metric that uh, we just introduced. Okay. Okay, just I'll call you the definition of Cauchy sequence. So we have that for any epsilon positive, there exists an index n bar such that for any n and then greater than n bar, we have that fn minus fn is less than epsilon, okay? Okay, then consider uh, for the computation, for instance, consider that uh, um, n, okay, for computation, just to fix the idea. Assume that n is larger than m, and we want to estimate fn minus fm, which by definition is nothing but the integral between a and b of fn minus fm. Okay, we can, of course, we can split this interval integral in three parts. So the part between A and C of Fn minus Fn plus C plus Fm plus c plus one over. Ah, I took probably it's better to take one over m and one over m and b of Fn minus Fm. Okay, so basically you have that this is zero. This part is zero. And this is less than one because we are both like this. Okay, okay then. The draw is not the best, but okay, you, you understand. So, so this is basically less than one over m. Okay, so it's enough to take n bar larger than one over epsilon, and you, and you got that indeed fn is a, is a Cauchy sequence. So this is a very easy, easy result. Okay, but. Now we want to prove that Fn does not converge in, uh, in, um, in the space of continuous function, okay? So we argue by, by contradiction. So assume that, so by contradiction, okay. 
assume that there exists a function, a continuous function belonging to our space. And such that we have that fn converts to f in this node. So we will see that we will, we will uh, reach uh, a contradiction, OK? So what we would obtain, so you consider ac of fn minus f, which of course is less or equal than this, which is precisely the norm that we are considering. OK. OK, but we know that fn is identically 0 in AC. So what you get is that AC uh, tends to 0. OK. Of course, this does, does not depend on, on, z, on n, so this means that this is 0. And so this means also that the integrand is 0, because it's positive. So in this, in this, uh, in this piece of the, of, the, of the full interval, OK? Now we consider the other part of the integral. We consider the part between the last part, so between c plus 1 over n and b of fn minus f, which again can be bound by the full integral. And this we know that goes to 0 by our assumption. OK? OK, but we know that here fn is equal to 0, so to 1, sorry. So you get this. OK, here you have that the left-hand side integral depends on n, but we know that the integral is continued with respect to the endpoints. So what we get is that this converts uh, this converts to C B one minus F. And so at the at the end what you get is that C B one minus F is equal to zero. So again by the same the analogous argument you have that F must be identically 1 in the integral CB. So at the end, what we found is that if f is the limit, f is like this. So it's 0 in, in AC. And this is 1 in CB, which of course tells you that f is not, is not continuous, OK? So we reach at a contradiction. This means that probably the continuous function is not a good space where to work, OK? OK, so we need to enlarge this function space. And uh, so the first way to do it will be to somehow um, to enlarge the domain in which those functions are, are defined, OK? So probably just interval or, or elementary set are not enough. May I raise? No, sorry. <laughs> so tell me if I. Uh, 
Uh, ok. So the way to um, to enlarge may I raise now or so the way to enlarge this uh, space function uh, is to introduce indeed the uh, Lebe Lebesgue integral. And to introduce the Lebesgue integral, we have first to, introdu to introduce the Lebesgue measure, okay? So you, you have to think of the Lebesgue measure as somehow at a, a generalization of the notion of length for, inter for, for intervals, okay? Okay, so I will first introduce some terminology, which is probably very easy, but just to, just to, to do it right from the beginning. So what do we mean as an interval? So these are intervals. So this would be a closed interval. This would be um, an open interval. And then you have half open and half closed. Since when you have this situation, okay. And then you have, uh, these are bounded intervals, and then you have also, also the half line is an interval, and uh, so when on the left you get the closed, and so on, I mean, so you have uh, minus infinity B and minus infinity B, okay, included. So, so we would like, as I told you, to have to give this definition of measure, of Lebesgue measure, in such a way that it extends the notion of uh, of length. So, and moreover, I will list now some property that we would like that the Lebesgue measure fulfill. We will see that it will not be possible <laughs> that uh, to find a measure that fulfill all the four properties that I will list. So we will be content with just three of them. We have to choose somehow. So the first one that we would like to have, I call it uh, the zero property, is the following. We would like to have a measure. So a set function um, which will extend the notion of length, which will be defined on the set of parts of R with values in uh, in the set of the of the extended real uh, numbers, okay. Uh, so P, PR is, is the set of parts. The set of parts of R, which is just is the, the collection of all the subset of R. So is the uh, collection. All the um, subset of R, and uh, I mean, if, and it contains, of course, also R itself and the empty set. Okay. And this it is. We will call it the extended real number. Yes, yes, it could be also plus infinity. For instance, if, if you think, as I told you, the, the measure that we are going to construct will extend the notion of length for integral. For instance, if you have to compute the length of these intervals, it will be plus infinity, okay? It's infinity, the length. So, of course, we have to include plus infinity also here, okay? Okay, so this is somehow the first property, the zero property, which just we want, we, we, we fix uh, the domain and the codomain that we would like to have. We will see that this is, is too much to require this. We, we will have to, to restrict the domain, but we will see later on. 
So the second property, or the first property, this property one, let's call it property one, is okay, is what I repeat, is that we want that the Lebesgue measure coincide with the length of an interval for any for any interval, okay? Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. As I told you, uh, you we 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 can see, uh, we can consider the empty set as a degenerate interval of measure uh, uh, measure zero. Okay. This is just uh, a brief remark. So the second property that we want. It's very crucial because we want to uh, to have good property when we pass to the limit, okay? We, because in in the application we, you you always pass to the limit. So, and this would be translate in in the requirement that uh, um, that we want that the countable uh, additivity property. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that if you have a collection EN, okay, in, uh, in the set of parts of R, of, uh, this is a sequence of these joints of, uh, so, they must be disjoints, it's important. Uh, disjoint set. Then, uh, of course, for which M is, is defined. Okay, then what you want? You want that the union of the countable union of this EN must be just the sum of EN. Of course, they have to be disjoint because otherwise. And uh, okay, so the contact, but this is then a just brief, uh, e maybe trivial remark, but just to be. So of course, this countable additivity property uh, immediately implies the finite additivity property. That says that of course, if you have, if you have this, also this will also if you have. A and B, two sets belonging to the set of parts of R, and A and B is joint. Then you have that also the measure of A, a union B will be. Hmm? Will be just the sum, no? And okay, this is, you can see that it is just defining. E1 equal A, E2 equal B, and then EN equal to the empty set for N larger equal to 3 because we require that. Okay, well, this is just an easy thing, but just to, just to fix the idea. And then we want to have another somehow geometric property to be fulfilled, which is quite intuitively. Um, so we want that M is translation invariant. So, or namely, we are requiring that the notion, the definition of measure will not depend on the location of uh, of the set. Th this, is a, this is trivial for, for interval, but we want to be preserved also for this uh, extended set, okay? Uh, so let me, uh, just let me write it more. So basically, if you have a set E, in a set of parts of R, and you define, take one, Y, one element Y in R, and you define 
E plus Y, which is the translated uh, set uh, with respect to Y, has X plus Y, where X belongs to E. So what we want is that the measure of E must be equal to the measure of E plus Y. Okay, uh, so we will see that it's not possible to have a, a set function M that satisfies all the four properties simultaneously. So somehow we have to get rid of one of them. So the third one, the last one, no, we cannot get rid of this because it's, I mean, this is, is too important. It means this is very intuitively M should depend on, sh shouldn't depend on the location. What we could do is to replace, to relax the second one um, in the sense that instead of requiring uh, a countable additivity property, we might require uh, the finite additivity property. Okay? In this case, you won't reach a contradiction, but it won't be useful for application because, as I told you, we want uh, to, to, to have good property when you pass to the limit. So we, we have to, 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 take, to, to, to maintain this. This one, of course, no, because we, we started by motivated by the fact that we want to, to extend the notion of the length. So what remains is to relax this. So somehow we will have to reduce the domain of uh, this uh, set function. So we will be, we, we have to be content with somehow a subset of the set of parts of R. So we will call this subset as the set of the back measurable set. And we will see that this is indeed, we will see during the course, this is indeed a true subset of, of the set of parts of R, okay? Okay, so let me, so basically now, so the aim of, of the first lectures of this course will be to construct a set function which satisfies the properties one, two, three, and to define a good domain for this, this set M, for this, uh, for this function M, okay? So may I erase here? Okay, so we will see that it would be convenient um, to define the domain of M um, in a way that is a, it is a sigma algebra, okay? Maybe you already know what is a sigma algebra. You already, did you already study? Yes, okay. But I will recall you again. <laughs> anyway. So you have that give you a definition So you have that given given x. Okay, I'm still stuck on on uh, on the real line uh, setting somehow. So you give a set x, and you consider a as a subset of the set of parts of x. So we have that a. A is a sigma algebra if if you have these three uh, property fulfilled, so you have that the empty set must belong to A, 
second one is, is, the, is that if A is a set that belongs to this uh, um, metallic A, if you want, then also the complement of A belongs, must belong to sigma algebra. And finally, if you have a sequence of a set AN, uh, such that AN belongs to A, then you must have that also the countable union of AN must belong to, to the sigma algebra. So we will construct M, the domain of M, in such, in this way, in a way that it will be, we will show that it's a sigma algebra. Okay. Oh yeah, that's, that's a, just a brief, uh, brief remark. You have that uh, probably you already know that the Morgan's law. Okay, from the the Morgan's law. Laws. It follows that. that also the intersection, the countable intersection of this set belongs to the sigma algebra <laughs> because of this should be the union. Okay, so you do operation that will still allows you to stay in the, in the set of, uh, in, in A, okay? Okay, uh, now I will introduce another definition. Let me just oh. Okay, so we shall say that is a countable, countably addi additive measure Negative, of course, extended real valued function. Okay, whose domain of definition is a sigma algebra? Algebra, I call it M, this italic M. Sigma algebra uh, M of sets such that, such that okay, we have that. These two properties are satisfied, so the measure of the empty set is zero. And then we want the countable additivity property because we call it a countable additivity measure. So we want that for any sequence EN in the sigma algebra of this joint set, of course.
we have that So what we want is the measure of the countable union of this En must be just the sum of the measure of the En. Okay, this is the definition of countably addit additive measure, which somehow uh, embodies all the requirements that, that I mentioned before. Not all of them, but we still want to have that to construct uh, a function like this, so a countably add additive measure, which in addition also is translation invariant. Okay. And, and preserve the notion of length. So. Okay, so now what we want to do from now on is the following task. So we want to construct a countably, a countably, countably additive measure. Measure which is translation invariant and such that preserve the notion of, of length. For any okay, for any interval, for any interval. Okay. So the standard bit measure has to go with one will be more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will be will be defined on a on set of R, on subset of R, yeah, yeah. In, uh, and we will call this, uh, I mean, the domain of M, as I told you, we, we will define, will be the, the, the Lebesgue measurable set, and we'll have values on, on the extended real line, okay? This is why I said that it's no negative, so it is from zero on, and uh, as values in the, ex in the extended real line. So it's, it's ex okay. Okay. Okay, now we will start to 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 construct okay this uh, such a function and to do this we will need first to introduce the notion of outer measure okay okay so Okay. So finally, we will define um, somehow this is an, an auxiliary definition, 
and we will pass through this definition in order to define uh, our Lebesgue measure, okay? Okay, so you consider a set A in R, and then just think about a collection of open intervals which cover A, okay? So, okay, first of all, you notice that, of course, A belongs to the set of parts of R. This is trivial. And consider a countable collection Okay, a countable collection, uh, call them IN, of open intervals which covers open intervals which cover A. Okay. So we have that A is contained in the union of, of I N. Okay. So we consider interval because for the same reason, because we know how to deal with the interval. We have the notion of length, so we have a, a starting point, okay? Okay, so for each such collection, you consider the sum of the length of these intervals, okay? And uh, you define as outer measure, so we define, we define uh, the outer measure in such a way. We have an uh, outer measure, we will call it as M star, okay? In this way, this will be a set function which will be uh, defined actually on the set of parts of R, so later we will restrict this with values in the extended real line. And uh, so we'll associate to a set A, these values, so will be the infimum of the sum of the length of I n, where I n is a set in the collection of open intervals which cover A, okay? Okay, this is a definition. Okay, just some uh, uh, some remark. Okay. So you have that the length of the interval, of course, are non-negative number. So this sum is well defined. So that it doesn't depend on on how on the order in which you sum. Uh, we are not talking about the empty set because, of course, at least you have R, which will cover A for sure. Okay. So this somehow it's a, it's a good definition. Okay, now we will we will list some property of this uh, outer measure. Okay, some really uh, easy easy property. Uh, okay, so it follows that. So the outer measure of the empty set will be zero, of course, okay? Because, uh, okay, you can think as a particular collection as uh, the collection of, uh, of, the empty, of the empty set, which can be understood as uh, the generate interval, okay? okay. Okay, then you have, uh, okay, the monotonicity property, or namely, if A is contained in B, then you have that the outer measure of A <coughs> is less 
or equal and the outer measure of B. Okay. So why this? So you can, yeah. So actually, when you consider this, uh, you're considering um, a bigger, bigger set. So the infimum, in principle, would be would be smaller. Okay. Yeah, for, it follows from the definition. Yeah, from the from the property of the infimum. Okay. So if you are doing the infimum in a bigger set, of course, you will, what you will get will be uh, smaller or equal. Okay. So just to. Okay, I, I just write this because to, to be complete, but of course it, it's easy. This is because when you consider this collection of IK, so where, uh, okay, IK, which covers um, the collection which covers B. This is a subset of the collection of the IK. Which covers that? Okay, so then you get by the property of infimum. You, you get the thesis, okay? Okay, then, okay, another easy thing is the following. Um, so I will erase it here. Okay, each set consisting of a single point has outer measure zero. Okay, this can be easily seen by the fact that of course you have that this single point set X. So for any epsilon this this set is contained in this symmetric interval. Okay, and the length of this interval. Yeah. Yeah. This one. I K. I K. Yeah. It's common B and less than the same. Uh, Are contained. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you can use them to, to cover A. Since A is smaller than B, you can use them to cover, okay? Yeah, it's the converse. So A is contained in B. But uh, all, all, all the collection which cover B will cover also A, okay? And so when you, 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 you do the infimum of this, this will be bigger than the infimum of this, okay? Yeah, it's the reverse. <laughs> okay. And so this is, of course, to epsilon. So this is, since this is true for any, okay, already, for any epsilon, you can make this length arbitrarily small. So this is, you get, 
let them stop of this single of this single point set is, is zero. Okay. Okay, these are easy easy things. That's okay. Okay. Okay, now at least we have defined this, this notion of outer measure and we just we just list some uh, some quick consequence of, of the of the definition. Okay, now we will uh, prove a proposition that tells you that the outer measure indeed extends the notion of length, no? which somehow is what we want. Okay, so the outer measure of an interval. is its length. Okay. Okay. Okay, to prove this claim, we will uh, just, we will argue by step. Okay. Okay, we will start uh, by considering um, a closed bounded uh, interval. And then, uh, step by step, we will uh, we will extend uh, the notion. Okay. Uh, so we will start with the case. The case i equal to a closed bounded interval. Okay. Okay, one way is, is quite easy in the sense that, um, let's call it um, step, this is step A, so. Okay, you have that for any, for any epsilon positive, you have that the corresponding open interval A minus epsilon and B, B plus epsilon. <coughs> we have that cover AB. So you can think about it, it as, a, as a set in the definition of, uh, of outer measure. So we have that. Uh, M star of A B is less or equal than B minus A plus two epsilon. This is for any epsilon, and this is follows from from the definition of. And so, as usual, it, since this is this holds for any epsilon, we can. This is preserved. This must be true. 
even when epsilon tends to zero. This is okay. So at least we proved one uh, one side of the of the equality. We want to prove the other one, which would be somehow more tricky. So now what we want to prove is the, is this. M star of A B is natural equal than B minus A. Okay, now we again we recall the definition of white of outer measure and we um, we observe that this would be equivalent to prove another fact, so by the definition so by the definition of outer measure which in turn is defined by the notion of infimum okay we have that It is equivalent to prove uh, to prove that if you have um, a countable collection. If n is a countable collection of of open intervals which covers uh, AB, Then we have that the sum of the length of i n, which is precisely the right hand side of the definition of of outer measure, is larger or equal than b minus a. And I call it star, because of course, if we prove this for any such a sequence. This will be preserved by, by the infimum, okay? Okay. So at this point, uh, we will make use of, of, the, of the Einborel theorem. Okay. So somehow it would be better to deal with a finite sequence. Now it would be easier. So this is why we will use the Einborel theorem. So by the by the Einborel theorem, we have that. <laughs> Okay, that any collection of open intervals which cover covering A B contains a finite which is which is what what we gain so we pass from a countable collection from a finite collection a finite sub collection
which also cover AB. Of course, it would be then it would be enough to prove star for this finite subcollection, okay? Yeah. Because I mean uh, the sum of the finite of the of the length of the finite subcollection would be no greater of the sum of the countable collection, okay? Okay, just I will. Just to be, it's enough to prove star for such a finite subcollection. So basically, we have that U is contained in the union of a finite uh, EI, of a finite collection. Okay, so we have that uh, since, so the closed interval is contained in this finite co collection. So of course, we have also that the element A, which belongs to this closed set, must belong to this union, of course. Okay, from this, there must be, we can deduce that must be one I n, which contains A, Okay, and uh, let us call, uh, let us uh, denote such e, such an interval i n has, uh, sorry, has oh, a one, b one. Okay, okay. Then there are two cases. The good one is that if you have that, if uh, B one is larger than B, then we are done. There's nothing to prove. So then, okay. Okay. Otherwise, we have to continue with that our argument so if on the contrary b1 is less than b so we call them b then we have to continue <laughs> then we have that b1 belongs to a b so and since B1 does not belong to A1, D1, open. There must be another interval. Must be an interval A2, B2, belonging to 
to this sub collection of course in the interval Because we, we, are, we are speaking about open interval, okay? Okay. So there must be an interval A2, B2, always in, belonging to the sub collection, in the finite sub collection. OK, such that B1 belongs to uh, A2, B2. And so we have something like this, A2, B1, B2. And also here, either B2 is larger than B, then it's OK, it's a good case. Or otherwise, is if B2 is less or equal than B, we have to continue with this, with this argument. And so if we iterate somehow this, uh, this, this argument, we, what we get? Uh, we will find a finite, uh, somehow, so, so I, don't, I don't worry about iterating this arm. We get a finite sequence of open interval belonging to the finite uh, subcollection, okay, from the collection. The Collection I N. Okay, such that they are placed in that way. So you have uh, you have A A I B I minus one and B I. So something like this. Okay, this is enough, I don't want to introduce something that is not useful. Okay. So the thing is that since our subcollection is finite, this, this process must end at some point. This is why we end up with some finite sequence of, of, uh, of interval, okay? Okay, and somehow this process is over, so the process is over when the endpoint B belongs to the open interval AK BK. And uh, okay. Okay, so finally what we get, we have that the sum of the length of I n is larger or equal than the sum of the length of A i b i. This I mean in the, the finite subcollection, okay? These are this the this, uh, mm, this interval that we selected somehow, no? So this is equal to what? This is a kind of telescopic sum plus you have BK minus one minus RK minus one. I mean, it's, it's not a telescopic sum, but you will see some Okay, 
Okay, so if you sum up in another way, uh, no, B, B1, C, B1, B1, A1, of course. So if you observe this, you have BK minus, you collect this term AK minus BK minus 1. And this is negative. And then you have minus AK minus 1 minus BK minus 2, which again is negative, minus A2 minus B1 minus A1. So at the end, you get that all this stuff here is larger than BK minus A1, okay? Because this is negative, but you have a minus in front, okay? Which is, of course, is larger than B minus A, okay? So at the end, what we found is indeed the inequality star that we, are, we were looking for is larger than B minus A. So somehow, uh, the statement the thesis follows from for for the interval for compact interval. Now the thesis follows for follows for i equal to a b. So now we have to extend this this equality to the other kind of of interval. So for instance for For any finite interval, ah, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> But yeah, but you have to deal with the open interval. Here we have. Uh, yeah, and then we just begin with the open from A to B. The cover of H okay, is itself. Okay, and uh, then its measure is B minus A. And then the closed measure from A to B is the rest joint union of three sets uh, the singleton A, the singleton B, and the open measure from A to B. From uh, the counter of this joint property, you can see that M star of the problem from A to B equals zero plus B minus A equals zero equals B minus A. I mean, I, I, I'm not, uh, not easy to follow you, but um, maybe we can discuss later. Uh, I don't know if you use the, the countable, uh, what do you use? The countable additivity property for what? For length or for what? Yeah, for length. I did not get your. <laughs> Maybe we can quickly discuss later because now I, I, I can. If, if I don't see the things were written, I cannot follow. Okay, now. We have to uh, to extend the proof for so we use what we prove so far to to extend this this this, this equality for uh, for any bounded set any bounded interval sorry okay so you have it. if i is any finite. interval okay then okay you, you already get what I want to do is that given any epsilon positive there is a closed interval 
call it J. Okay, such that you have that J is contained in I and the length of J can be controlled from below by the length of I minus uh, epsilon. Okay, hence what we get. Okay, you have that the length of I minus epsilon is less than the length of J. And this is equal, this is for the step before, is equal, this is step, uh, uh, probably I call, I call it A, this is step B. J, J is contained in, uh, in, in I, okay? Okay, and this is less or equal. This, now you, you use the monotonicity property of M star of I less or equal to M star if you want again for the monotonicity property of I, clo the closure of I, which is equal of the length of I closure, which is equal to the length of I. So we know that this, this, this holds for length, okay? So since this is true for any epsilon positive, you get that indeed the outer measure of E A of I is equal to the length of I. Okay. And uh, so because it's in between these two, okay? So finally, what remains to prove is that if I is an infinite interval, okay, then you have that. closed interval J contained in I such that you have that the length of this closed interval J is equal to this arbitrary large M. Okay, as you have star of i is larger or equal than m star of j is equal to the length of j which is m. Okay, since this is true for any m, then any m positive of course, then you have that m star of i equal to plus infinity which is, is equal to the length of i. Okay so with this we conclude we span all the cases we consider all the cases we conclude this proof. So okay In the last minute okay just anticipate you what we will prove tomorrow.
Okay, so tomorrow we will we will prove the following. We will prove the countable subadditive property for the outer measure. Okay, so this is will be our proposition. So you have a n b a countable collection of set real number you don't need to to require them to be disjoint because we just get what we get is so weak that we can also uh, take them as any any countable collection. So what we, we will prove is that the outer measure of this countable union will be less or equal of the sum of the outer measure of a n. Okay. So for the outer measure, we just be uh, we will just be we just obtain this less or equal, not even if we require co a countable um, disjoint set, we cannot. We have somehow to to restrict the, the set that we. So we will have to introduce another notion of, of, of measure. Okay, so this is the sub additive. Uh, okay, sub additive property. Okay, and then I can I will Okay, in the last minute we can just introduce some terminology, but tomorrow I will I will recall you again. So we will denote with this italic G uh, the collection of open sets of R with the with this italic F on the covers the closed sets of R and with G delta. Uh, okay, the family, let's call it the family of sets obtained as uh, as countable uh, intersection of, of open set. With F, uh, sig F sigma, uh, the family. Uh, okay, the family of set obtained as countable um, union. of closet set. Okay. So somehow the idea, I mean, the reason why we introduce this family of a set is that we shall see that we, this somehow are nice set, easy set, set set that you can imagine, okay? Would be to approximate the measurable, the Lebesgue measurable set by means of this uh, easy set, treatable set, okay? So it would be very useful for us to see that you can approximate in some suitable way a 
the, the, the Lebesgue measurable set by means of a set picked from, from, this, from this class of, uh, of set, okay? From this family. Okay, thank you for today. We can stop. <laughs>